It's my pleasure to be here today and uh, to share with you some of the exciting things that I've learned over the last 18 months uh, by putting Watson to work, as I call it. You know, Watson at play was where Jeopardy was. And over the last 18 months, we've been trying to put Watson to work. And I'm not going to talk about it from an IBM perspective, so it's not an IBM commercial. It's more about my own insights about how exciting and how powerful this set of technology is. is oh, they're already proving out to be and what they would mean for mankind. Uh, in fact, I'm so excited about the results that we're seeing. I'm going to share with you that. And also, I'm going to draw an arc to show what, if you can extend what we're seeing now, what that might mean for humanity. It is so powerful, uh, in fact, that I consider this to be the most meaningful thing I have done in my professional life. And believe me, I've done a few interesting things. Uh, done a couple of startups, driven a Formula One car at over 200 miles an hour. But this is even more cooler and exciting than, uh, than anything I've done in my life. So, so let's kind of uh, go through a few of these. So you all probably saw the, you know, the Jeopardy game. How many of you saw the Jeopardy game? Right, so yeah, we got about a... 80% unaided recall on, on what Watson is. And um, so the obvious question is, you know, why did it capture our imagination? What's the big deal about Watson? And it's this whole notion of computers beginning to understand human speech and human language and learn from human beings, right? Uh, for example, if you ask a computer a question, you know, who ran GE? And unless you have, in the existing computer systems, a database and a table that says CEO and company, that's a very brittle query. Computers can't answer that. What Watson can do is read through, in fact, all of the Wikipedia, all of most of the world's information we're going to put into Watson now. It can read a paragraph like the one you see up there and say, you know, based on my understanding of human semantics and syntactics and synonyms and similes and metaphors, I can deduce that Jack Welch ran GE at this time. Right? It's the beginning of computers that start, you know, what you call as cognitive computing, computers that understand, not just calculate. What's even more interesting is human language, in English in particular, is not the most easiest of languages. So we have things like, you know, noses that run and feet that smell. How does the machine understand that? You know, feet are supposed to, are supposed to run and noses are supposed to smell. So the so computer understands that. Watson understands that. Not only that, it can understand very domain-specific stuff. Now we are teaching Watson medicine, and I'll share with you what some of the exciting things we are finding by putting Watson into medical school, right? And uh, we are finding that there is a whole new domain of how doctors speak, and Watson is becoming very adept in medicine very fast. In fact, right now we believe it's operating at the level of a first-year medical student. Uh, I'll share with you how and why and what the consequences of this is. What is also important about this is that these are computers that are beginning to act and understand on information, not just data, right? This is the beginning of machines that are information-based, not data-based. And that's particularly relevant now because 90% of the world's information was created in the last two years. 90% of humanity's information was created in the last two years, and 80% of the 90% is not numbers. It's doctor's notes, call center notes, Amazon reviews, Facebook tweets, things that today computers can't understand. Watson, by the Jeopardy demonstration, started proving that machines can now start understanding human speech and language and learn as they understand and interact with the machine. So I'll share with you some of that journey. In fact, I believe it is as powerful as any of the three big shifts that I've seen or mass movements that I've seen in humanity. And this is not an exaggeration when I say that. When you look back in history about how humanity has grown and scaled, in my mind, when it comes to knowledge and information, there were three big shifts. The first one was back in Mesopotamia, you know, and about the, the whole development of the alphabet, the, you know, the, the, the very early cuneiform tablets. You know, we go back, what, 34 BCs or even beyond that, some people say. Followed that up with the, with the Gutenberg Press, right? Again, a whole new scale in which humanity started learning and, and disseminating knowledge and information. We then, of course, got to the Internet, okay? Game changer. I like to say that, you know, when I'm dead and gone, the two things I leave behind is my DNA through my kids and my digital footprint in terms of what Google says about me, right? So ours is the first generation that's going to leave a digital exhaust, okay? Everyone before us, you were dead and gone when the last person who knew your name could, could remember you. You were wiped off of humanities. Ours is the first generation that is going to live forever in some way 
because that information about us. So be very careful about what you put on Facebook and what you tweet, because people 200 years from now will figure out what you exactly said that day when you had a few more, more margaritas than you should have had. But um, so, so that's the exciting part about, about the internet. The next, I think, curve and the jump comes up with technologies like Watson. And, and by no means, IBM's got you know, a, a start on it. I fully expect multiple companies and multiple industries to be formed around it. And what it is, is we've named this era the cognitive computing era, okay? This is a class of machines that are capable of learning from interactions and data, and not just based on programming. So here's the machine. So Watson learns like we learn as human beings. Watson learns by reading stuff. So Watson's learned over 2 million pages of cancer research, and all of cancer's data in the world is already in it. So Watson learns by reading, just like we do. Watson learns when people ask questions of it, just like our parent and teachers ask questions of us and say, you know, what do you think about it? And they correct us. We have oncologists, we have call center people training and teaching Watson and correcting Watson. And then Watson learns by doing, just like we learn by doing. So it's a whole different paradigm of machines that are able to learn and interact. There's not a whole lot of programming involved in Watson. It's more reading and understanding and interacting and growing from it. Okay. One of my favorite examples, I used to often wonder, you know, uh, way before I got the Watson assignment, and I came into IBM about six years ago when they acquired a company I was a founder and CEO of, and, and one of the things I used to always admire about technology was, you know, how far can things like Google and all go? And I used to always wonder, do you guys know who Alexander the Great's teacher was? Aristotle, right? So Aristotle taught Alexander the Great for 14 years. Right? And then before that, Plato and Socrates, there was a whole line of knowledge there. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way for us to go back and learn and, and capture what it is that was taught so we can use as a humanity going forward? When they're dead and gone, this moved on. With technologies like Watson, humanity now, if you look out 50 years, 100 years, I believe is going to be at a bending of the knowledge curve for the humanity because now you're not just capturing the information about people, you're capturing the knowledge about those people, their experiences about people. So one of the guys in, uh, at MD Anderson uh, down in Texas, Dr. Monero, the world's leading ex expert in blood cancer, he is teaching Watson how he treats blood cancer. And he demonstrated in a project that today it takes them about three years to come up with new cancer therapies because of all the big data that's coming at it as a process. We put Watson to work there. They came back and told us now they believe they can come up with new cancer therapies in 10 months. Okay, just imagine that. Now what essentially I'm doing is Dr. Monero is the Aristotle of oncology. And we are capturing his knowledge and putting this into a machine so generations from now on can benefit from his knowledge and insight. So when I say, you know, that this is the beginning of a bending of a mass movement and a bending of the knowledge curve, that's what, it's not a hyperbole. It's not something that I'm saying out of excitement or, uh, I do believe that if we project this out 50 or 20 years from now, it's going to be a dramatic shift in our understanding and our, uh, our evolution as a race. So how does it do it? Watson at the heart does three things. Number one, it understands human speech at scale. It can process the system that played Jeopardy, 200 million pages in three seconds. Okay, can read 200 million pages, understand the meaning of those 200 million pages in three seconds. Second, it generates an answer for you with a confidence level. If you ask Watson a question, what is the initial dosage of antibiotics for a seven-year-old child with a history of asthma, right? Google will give you 3 million pages with keywords on it. Watson will come back and say, 3 teaspoons, 2 times a day, 82% confidence. And here are 42 sources why I say that. And some of these sources, I know that asthma goes by seven other medical names. And I pulled all of that for you. Okay? So it's the beginning of what I call as probabilistic applications. Applications that can give you a confidence level, not a deterministic application. They're saying yes or no. And then last but not the least, it learns from the response you select. Okay? So very cool stuff, very transformative stuff. So one of the first areas we applied this, I had a choice to make when I got appointed general manager and said, as I like to say, convert smarter to richer. That was my mission, right? The smart technology, how do you put it to work for the betterment of society and make a lot of money for IBM in the process? First area we applied was healthcare. Healthcare is a massive big data problem, fragmented industry, full of stuff. That picture you see that there? There's just one hospital with the medical records. That's how it's stored today. Watson can read all of those records and understand it in, in, in six seconds flat, okay? Not only that, it can start helping with diagnosis. And stay with me on this. It's a little bit of a complex build out. Here's a case of a 58-year-old woman that was being read in an electronic medical record, okay? 
she complains of dizziness, anorexia, dry mouth, and so on and so forth. And then Watson reads the medical record, starts pulling out the stuff in red. We call it PCI, pertinent clinical information. And says, you know, just based on symptoms alone, I believe she has the flu. Then you say, okay, Watson, on top of the symptoms, here's a family history. Her sister had this issue. Her mother had Graves' disease. And they had an oral cancer. She Watson says, you know what, now that I know that, I think it's looking like diabetes to me. Then you say, okay, here's the patient's history. Last three years, this is what we have treated her on. This is how she responded to different medicine. So Watson's overlaying that information. So symptoms, family history, patient history. And, and now it's building a diagnosis model in medication that is giving the doctor a sense for what may be going on with this person. Okay, very powerful and transformative stuff if you recognize that healthcare, the knowledge of medicine is doubling every five years. There are 12,000 diseases that are known to mankind. So imagine that if by the time you go to a medical school and the time you come out, what was known to you has doubled. And doctors are spending less than five hours a month reading up medical journals, right? Completely messed up my sense of security when I walk into a clinic now, right? I Google like hell before I go into a thing saying, let me find out what's going on. The doctor's reading only five hours a month. But, but imagine a technology like Watson working as an assistant to the doctor, right? This is not making decisions on behalf of you. It is like a GPS system for doctors. That's taking all the knowledge that's known to mankind. And it's like having the power of a thousand best oncologists behind every oncologist that's out there in doing a diagnosis. Because the machine is able to understand and comprehend stuff that the human brain just cannot. The other part is we believe that Watson is going to in time change. You know, if I look ahead in 2020, the way medicine is researched, medicine is practiced, and medicine is taught. Cleveland Clinic, after we did Jeopardy, I challenged the Watson team and I said, Let's now take Watson to the next level. Let's make Watson pass the U.S. medical licensing exam, the U.S. board exam. After they stopped throwing darts at me and, you know, bringing out some other things, I said, you know what, we are going to try and see how far we go. And here's the interesting part. In 18 months, we are within striking distance of making Watson pass the U.S. medical licensing exam. Okay, we have taken the practice test. Now, these are non-image based yet. And, and we are finding accuracies that are within reach of making this machine pass the U.S. medical licensing exam. Just imagine the power and the possibilities. So as you fast forward this, you can only imagine implications of a technology like this, okay? Healthcare, you know, the only $2 trillion industry that we have, right? $1.8 trillion, 18% of the U.S. GDP, full of problems, right? You can look at this in financial services. If I'm a bond trader, if I'm a hedge fund manager, I have to read through 100 different treasury bonds and prospectors on municipal bonds. Every one of them is a 200-page document and create a portfolio. It could change how I make decisions and investments. Uh, contact centers. Every call center in the world could use a Watson. One of the things we have done, and we're announcing this next month, um, but we've started talking about it already, is this notion of a baby Watson. The system that I inherited with a game playing Jeopardy was the size of a master bedroom. And as you heard, I live in Austin, and in Texas they have pretty big master bedrooms. Uh, we have reduced that master bedroom size machine down to a one server machine now, okay, in the last 18 months. It's nine inches high, 18 inches wide, 36 inches deep, it weighs about 100 pounds. We call it a baby Watson. And it's 240% faster than the machine that played Jeopardy, pound for pound. Now we're beginning to start launching applications that every call center in the world, which is a big data problem, where people are searching information, you can have Watson as an assistant, right? Uh, government agencies, you can start imagining, but particularly with the kind of recent stuff that we've been through here as to how they could start using technologies like this. So very promising areas where I see a massive shift and a mass movement towards adoption of a new technology that will change the way we think, act, and, and learn from. The other exciting part, as if this was not enough, I see another massive thing coming at us. You know, uh, I call it the schumpetering of the world. In fact, it's the term from Eric Topol, but there are some major technology forces that are converging in this industry. Things like mobile. Everyone's shifting from the PCs to smartphones and tablets. Things like cloud computing. So people call it the hand to cloud and back. That's how we're gonna work, right? Things like big data. This is data coming, it is like I said, 90% created in the last two years, doubling every five years. Uh, things like social where people are sharing more and more information in text and other information about us, analytics, and then millennials, people who expect to interact with systems very different than how most of us in our 40s or beyond uh, tend to look at. So when you start looking at the conversion of this and a technology like Watson, I think it's going to be a fun three to five years in the IT industry where you can use some of these threads and accelerate. Imagine a Watson in the cloud. 
Imagine if you are a farmer in sub-Saharan Africa or in India or China with no medical facilities and your son comes running to you and says, I just got bit and you don't know what it is, but you have a smartphone. Imagine taking a picture of it, what's an analyzing and saying that's an allergic reaction or it's a spider bite or it looks like a snake bite. Here's the triage information and here's the nearest location of a doctor. You want me to call it for you. It's the beginning of democratization of medicine through technologies like cloud and mobile and others that you can start seeing within our lifetime. This is one of the reasons I say this is the most exciting thing I've done in my life in terms of getting it going. And we're beginning to see the results of shifting it from a game playing machine to a machine that's solving real society's problems. We're only at the beginning of this. You know, we call it, IBM calls it the, the cognitive computing era. The first era was tabulating systems. In fact, IBM started off as CTRC, computing and tabulating research company, recording company. Uh, they did meat, uh, meat grinders and cheese slicers and punching machines and weighing machines, all of them calculating. We then got into the programmable machine era, which is the mainframe and the PCs and all we are in, where we are believe the, the world is going to now, the computers are going to now, is a cognitive system era. We're beginning to emulate how the brain works and thinks and acts and assists and, 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 and help the brain kind of do things faster. It's shifting from calculating rapidly to learning from data and interactions. One of the things I like to say is, in five years we'll look back and say that machines before Watson were nothing but giant calculators. Computers after Watson were cognitive systems that understood us and interacted with us and start helping us make decisions. So very exciting times ahead of us. And then, um, I do believe that if you look at 50 or 100 years, this is going to be the shift in the humanity's life, or I call what is being called as homo digitus. You know, homo sapiens have had it, Homo digitus is where it's going. Where you've got a Watson in the cloud and a mobile phone or a Google glasses and you're able to connect to these things. And it's not very hard. It's not very hard to make that leap and that connection. And, and the thing I like about the graphic a lot is the crouching person on a PC is not in our futures, which I'm very happy about. With, with due apologies to Microsoft and DOS and Windows, I think where we are moving to is a more exciting world where it's more variable computing, personal computing, and computing from the cloud to you and interacting sort of in, in, in wherever you are. So with that, again, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity and uh, watch this space for a lot more exciting things coming our way. Thank you.